turnouts, uh, certainly a reflection of the, uh, uh, the speaker in the top this evening. So uh, welcome. Um, a couple of business items I need to mention before we uh, get into tonight's speaker. Uh, our last monthly meeting, and that was our November lecture, uh, was canceled uh, due to bad weather. And uh, that was Jim Connor, incidentally, uh, who was going to talk about uh, John Clinch of uh, Trinity. Uh, Clinch being a very interesting character, uh, part-time missionary, part-time doctor, part-time magistrate, part-time husband, uh, who, lived, who, lived for, who lived for 50 uh, uh, lived for 50 or 60 years in the in the Trinity area, uh, made quite a name for himself. There's been some write-ups on him recently, but that was uh, that was a very popular lecture. We anticipated a big crowd, but due to bad weather, we were it canceled out. So we rescheduled that to September. Uh, that's that's the earliest we could fit it back in. Uh, on the matter of bad weather, uh, as as in November. Uh, we normally send uh, a media advisory to the CBC Radio Storm Center, but we've had complaints that with all the other announcements that come in from businesses and organizations and schools that our announcement gets buried and it's really hard to find. I actually went looking for it myself. I couldn't find it. So in future, uh, we're going to place cancellations on our Facebook page uh, as well. And if you're not facing eyes in the Facebook, uh, we'll also list it on our, on our website. And uh, we're hoping to post it there as well. And if the weather is dicey and you're not sure whether we're going ahead or not, we'll also put a note there to let you know that things are indeed going ahead. Now, as luck would have it, the uh, November lecture was also our annual Gilbert Higgins lecture. And that's one that we co-host with the uh, Museum Association and the Archivists Associations of Newfoundland. And uh, so what we decided now is that our February lecture next month uh, will be the Gilbert Higgins lecture for this particular lecture series. And I'll have a little bit more to say about that at the, uh, at the uh, close tonight. I'd also like to give everyone uh, a heads up on our March presentation, which is two months away. Uh, as it is uh, quite a bit out of the ordinary, we're going to have a trial. And we're going to retrial Catherine Snow, who was the last woman hanged in Newfoundland. And uh, that dastardly deed took place in 1838. And uh, there were a number of religious and political undercurrents uh, to that trial that will be explained by way of introduction at that uh, symposium. And by retrial, I, I really mean a court trial. We've actually, we have an honest to goodness judge. And uh, two of St. John's finest lawyers uh, who will represent the prosecution and the defense and we might even dress them up in period wigs and robes if they are us. So we'll see what happens. But the most interesting thing about it all is that uh, following the lawyer's presentations, uh, the, the judge will charge the jury under modern law rather than 19th century law. And uh, the jury will be the audience. So it'll be interesting to see if Catherine Snow uh, would have been found guilty of the murder of her husband under modern law whether Catherine Snow will be vindicated at last, and so it'll be up to you, the audience. And if you want to read up on Catherine Snow, uh, just before Marx, there's a fictional account of her life and trial, uh, which came out a couple of years ago. Uh, the author was Nellie Strobe, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, it. Uh, but it's still in the bookstores. I've seen it there recently, so it's, uh, it's a good book if you want to brush up on that. Now, come September this year, we're going to have a symposium on Captain James Cook and his travels and his work in Newfoundland waters in the mid-1700s. Uh, he was producing charts for uh, navigation and for military purposes. And Cook is considered the father of modern hydrography or chart making. And while he's better known historically for his work in the Pacific, he actually learned his trade. He honed his skills as a chart maker here in Newfoundland waters before heading to warmer regions. Uh, he, he should, probably should have stayed here. I think he had his head cut off in Hawaii somewhere, so he probably should have stuck around Newfoundland. But most speakers for the Cook Symposium have been confirmed, and uh, we should be able to provide a sneak preview of some of those topics uh, in our next newsletter, which will come out in, in May or so. So have a look at that. Now, in our next newsletter, we'll also be announcing and explaining an increase in membership fees, something we're always reluctant to do. 
But as of September, uh, we're going to have to increase our membership fees by $5 a year. And that's because the subscription rates that were being charged for the Newfoundland Quarterly are going up substantially. And uh, we have a wonderful partnership with the Quarterly. We've had meetings with them recently about this, but there's no way we can avoid this, uh, this increased charge. Uh, as you know, the Quarterly is part of the Society of Membership. Um, one last item before we introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, you probably noticed the video camera uh, recording presentations in recent months. And a fellow there, by the way, is Keith Butler. And he's our fabulous AV guy uh, who sets up the PowerPoint and all the other formats for speakers and looks after problems every, every month for us. Um, but for your information, those tapings are placed on our website for access by individuals uh, unable to attend. So if you can't attend yourself, or you have family or friends uh, outside the city, outside the province, who may be interested in listening in on some of our lectures, uh, uh, let them know. And it's a benefit for you as well. If you happen to miss a lecture, you can always catch up on the, on the website. So, but we can't promise that every speaker will be taped uh, because uh, it's their choice. But so far, we've had great cooperation. Uh, that's it, I think. Uh, yes, it is. So, so on to our lecture. I'd like to call on uh, Shane O'Day now, a good friend of uh, our speaker tonight, to introduce tonight's speaker. So, Shane. creation, study, and preservation of Newfoundland architecture. As an architect, he had a hand in one of our most notable contemporary buildings, the Memorial University Library, as well as some quite wonderful recent houses that very fluently speak the local dialect. As an architectural historian, he was responsible for the writing and production of a beautiful and Winterset award-winning book on the material culture of tilting. In doing that, in doing the work on tilting, he became a preservationist, not just by restoring his own house up there, but more by bringing tilting's cultural landscape to the attention of Newfoundland, Canada, and the world. Now, with Newfoundland modern, he brings another much neglected aspect of our architecture to the fore and will I'm pretty certain that this book do much to ensure its salvation. So it's on these and the buildings of our recent past he will talk to us tonight, Robert Mallon. Well, thank you very much, Shane, for your kind words. And thank you all for this uh, wonderful turnout on a snowy evening. About a year and a half ago, I went to visit Shane in his office at Memorial University to ask for his help in some of my research on modern architecture. And he told me, I really can't help you. It's not my period. But he's a bit too modest because if you didn't talk with him, he certainly believed that it was his period. Uh, he knows uh, about uh, the local architecture, the, the historical architecture, and, and modern architecture, and also, uh, more importantly, he understands some of the social and cultural aspects uh, uh, behind this architecture. So uh, I'm really uh, pleased to have this opportunity. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, for those of you who may have heard my talk about a year and a half ago uh, at the Newfoundland, and Labrador Association of Architects meeting. I apologize for uh, representing much of that material tonight. Uh, for those of you who attended my book launch, uh, sponsored by the Newfoundland Historic Trust, uh, and you heard 
some of this material uh, at that event. I apologize to you uh, for, again, representing some material. For those of you who have read the book, um, <laughs> uh, I really don't want to hear it again. I do have a few more slides that I can share with you tonight, uh, perhaps a few more stories. For those of you who didn't like the book, again, I apologize. <laughs> so, uh, on it goes. Uh, but uh, the, uh, another encouraging uh, opportunity for me to spread the word about uh, the modern architecture of the province is that I have been invited to be the plenary speaker, whatever a plenary speaker is, for the uh, Royal Architectural Institute of Canada's uh, annual festival, which will be held in St. John's this spring. So, uh, I'll be <laughs> I have the opportunity to share uh, some of this uh, architecture uh, with architects from all across the country. Before I start, I'd just like to uh, thank the designer of my book, Glenn Galuska. Uh, I never had a chance to work with him intensively in the first few months of the book's preparation. Uh, McGill Queen's uh, University Press kept him away from me probably thinking that architects tend to meddle in things and that it would, it would slow down the process. Uh, but they did let me meet him in July in Montreal and unfortunately he passed away one month later. Uh, but he was revered in uh, uh, the typography and graphic design community uh, all across Canada. Uh, and he never lived to see this, his final project uh, completed, but uh, he really did an outstanding job in my opinion. Uh, if any of you uh, would, haven't had a chance to purchase the book, I do have, uh, I brought a few copies with me tonight. I have, uh, they're out on the desk here, and uh, they're being sold at a discount. If, you, if you'd like me to sign some, uh, we can do that after. So, why did I put Smallwood in the title of, of this book? Uh, when I was doing the research, it kept popping up in almost everything I was uh, studying. And even when I would talk with people, other architects, uh, he was uh, always uh, uh, involved in some way in, in a project. Either uh, he knew uh, who was working on it or how it came about, or he was actually guiding it, selecting the architects, and so on. Uh, so I think most of you know that uh, he had an encyclopedic memory, and he seemed to know everyone in the province. And he would know where you were born and who you were relatives were, and whether or not you were a liberal or conservative <laughs> and worth having around or were not. Uh, so uh, architects fell under this gaze. And uh, here you can see Smallwood uh, standing in a display of the World Trade Center somewhere in New York City before the building was built. Uh, and he always had an interest in modern architecture. And the point that I try to make in the book is that he really tried to use this architecture as a demonstration of the progress of this administration. Uh, so um, all, it, there were uh, many changes in the province after Confederation, as you all know. Uh, and I haven't gone into these uh, in any substantial way. Uh, but I tried to show that with education reform, economic reform, uh, changes, and, and, uh, uh, and the like, that architecture uh, played a part in some of these changes. So most people uh, really think of Newfoundland architecture as being uh, the, the memorable vernacular architecture of uh, outport Newfoundland, or perhaps the colorful houses that we see in St. John's, but uh, not very many people outside Newfoundland were aware of modern architecture. And I found even though I'm not from Newfoundland, I've lived here pretty well since 1974, I was also a bit blind to this architecture, especially uh, when I uh, first came here, I didn't really notice it. I was just out of architecture school. I had a chip on my shoulder. I, I sort of knew what the latest and greatest was in architectural design, or at least I thought I did. And uh, so it wasn't until years later that I really started to appreciate some of this architecture. And then I started to understand its genesis in time and space, that uh, here it's being done in uh, uh, a place that has really been uh, uh, quite traditional in, in many ways, uh, and it was remarkable what architects were achieving uh, in the 1950s and 1960s uh, when there were no precedents locally for uh, uh, 
much of this modern architecture. But there were, were in fact, a few precedents, uh, not strikingly modern perhaps, but contextually modern, such as uh, Apothecary Hall, uh, restored a few years ago by Bill McCallum, now sitting rather forlornly by itself on Water Street. I think I'm going to have to adjust my uh, computer here for a second because I'm missing part of the images. Uh, let me see if I can do that. And the West End Fire Station, uh, it's not uh, dramatically modern, but again, background modern. And uh, the, one of the people involved in the programming for this was AJC Payne. Uh, last name was spelled P-A-I-N-E. And uh, there's a chance that he uh, was born in Newfoundland, I'm not quite sure. But uh, he uh, ended, up, ended up working mostly on the main line in Montreal, working with sunlight. Uh, and uh, did quite a number of buildings, uh, including when he came back here, uh, the normal school on Mary Mayden Road, the Memorial Stadium, and Confederation Building. And he was involved with the programming also uh, for Memorial University. So this is one of his projects that he, he collaborated with Park and Architects on the Sunlight Building. So this history seems to be forgotten, and you can't really find out very much about Payne. He was uh, uh, nominated for honorary membership in the Newfoundland Association of Architects sometime in the 60s, but that uh, was never uh, approved. So uh, anyway, some of the other precedents for modern architecture uh, before Confederation, you would all know these buildings, of uh, the buildings in Pleasantville. And uh, I never really noticed these. They perhaps look like US military buildings all around the world. But uh, you can see an influence in these little, uh, these structures on Paul Machino, who later did many of the houses in Churchill Park the way the corners are arranged here, uh, that it was quite a daring and modern uh, detail at this time to erode the corner and to have this little wall. So if you look at some of the apartments in Churchill Square, or uh, just behind Churchill Square, you'll see this same wall detail uh, repeated with the corners cut out. And of course, the flat roofs. Uh, building by uh, Bill Ryan, which was uh, the Cabot Building, then Q Radio, and then Workplay for a while, and I'm not sure what's there now. Uh, but a lot of these concrete buildings that were done uh, in the uh, 40s or so, uh, the building by Bill Ryan, which bravely anticipates many uh, postmodern developments of the 70s and the 80s of a larger than life cartoon of some classical columns, uh, supersized details uh, that uh, must have been quite stunning at the time. And of course, the TAS building. And uh, Smith Stockley, which uh, actually wasn't Smith Stockley, it was the Cornwall Theater, and the Air American Area Water Company building to the left of that. Uh, this, these are photographs that Ned Pratt uh, took when we went around about 10 or 11 years ago to take a few photographs all on one snowy day. Uh, we just had a little bit of snow, and you can see some of the snow up on this little lantern. And unfortunately, this lantern was removed by uh, the Provincial Works Services Department because it was a nuisance. Uh, so probably it leaked, or maybe it needed painting. So unfortunately, that got chopped off. And if you look at the building today, uh, it's just the E going across there. And of course, the marquee for the theater is no longer there. But there's some wonderful detailing in the concrete work that you can see here, the date of the building, and almost a Frank Lloyd Wright type of imprint in the concrete web on the building. So it's held up very well over the years. But I really regret that this lantern is gone. This, I don't know if you can see very well, uh, another interesting precedent is not just architecture that uh, was modern before Confederation, but also uh, there was some innovative planning here. And if you're familiar with the history of com uh, company towns throughout North America, this is one very interesting precedent. Of course, the town plan for Corner Brook, uh, the architect uh, uh, Cobb from Nova Scotia was heavily involved in this. Uh, one area for the uh, workers, another area for the management, and then another area in the town that was almost a recreation of a Newfoundland outport with houses placed anywhere you like without any services and infrastructure or casual labor. So uh, it had three divisions. Critical park under development. I love these old photographs 
I have to thank Joe Scheuer and Chris Sharp for including me in some of their uh, research over the years and some of the events uh, that they've been involved with for uh, Churchill Park. There's a remarkable story here. And in my book, I just skimmed it a little bit. I thought I had to mention it, but uh, there's a lot more that uh, I hope will appear on this uh, one day. Uh, here you can see, uh, again, the little corner detail that's quite similar to the buildings in Pleasantville. And of course, another bold thing at this time was the corner window. And of course, uh, Paul Machino, who was working for Sir uh, Brian Dunhill, uh, uh, had the uh, little uh, vent windows arranged on either side uh, of the windows. And Churchill Park. I really like this photograph because uh, if you look at it, I could study this one for an hour and see things. But uh, of course, there's no parking here at the moment. It's more like a village green, which is this. This was supposed to be one of the three village greens, centuries of the villages that were going to appear along Elizabeth Avenue at this time. Uh, almost a new urbanist type of project, which we have only started to hear about in the last 10 or 15 years of making more con uh, concentrated and memorable places in suburbs. Uh, but you can see that the square is not completed here. And there are some notable buildings that are absent uh, along Elizabeth Avenue. Um, this is where one of the houses uh, is that I'm going to show you later, a house that Angus Campbell designed for his partner, George Cummings. It was just an open field here at the moment. And of course, uh, the uh, Bethel Synagogue is not here, and a few other buildings. So great photographs. And of course, under construction, flat roofs, and a detail that has come back to haunt us in modern architecture. Almost every building that gets an award these days has a kind of extruded section which comes out and pops into a wall. So if you open an architecture magazine, they are ubiquitous, right? And uh, so architects have actually gone back to this uh, stylistic device. Here you can see a uh, typical house in Churchill Park with the vent windows. Paul Machino was uh, conscript, uh, conscripted to work on this project, and he had a whole team of people working for him doing drafting. And uh, there were lots of innovations in these houses. One of the stories that I uh, liked hearing was uh, uh, about the um, vents that uh, the, the new residents found, and typically in the hallway of, of these houses. And, uh, they thought that maybe they were sweeping, for sweeping dust into. So, uh, you know, everyone would pile, you know, sweep all the dust in, into these. And then there were complaints about the heating. Why isn't the heating working? Right? So, this is the furnace. Uh, there were also complaints uh, in the beginning of the project that the fitted kitchens that were being planned were too elaborate. There should just be unfitted kitchens, a sink here, maybe a little table there, and so on. Uh, too luxurious. But uh, there's quite a story about this. Little vent windows are almost all gone now in Churchill Park. Uh, still a few left. Also, duplex houses in this area. Um, this is the interior standing inside uh, this little house, which we visited uh, with Paul Machino when he came back after about uh, a 50 year absence from his life, uh, just to see the houses and to also see some other, uh, the Goldstone house that he had designed. And uh, another one of my favorites. Still standing, still in its original condition pretty well. Now this reminded me of uh, a field trip that I took when I was on uh, at one of the vernacular architecture forum uh, meetings. Uh, we had a meeting in Greenbelt, uh, and a, a field trip in Greenbelt, which is outside Washington, D.C. And we were in a new plant suburb, uh, which is also a, now a national historic site. Uh, and uh, I thought, well, this is really interesting. The houses are quite similar to Churchill Park with their little corner windows. But what they had done was they actually made one of these little um, houses a museum. So you could actually go in and see what the furniture was like at this time. And this is the interior. Uh, so they kept the original layout. And I always thought to myself, well, wouldn't that be great if we could get one little house somewhere in Churchill Park and do something similar? So in the early years of the Newfoundland Association of Architects, this is what architects had to worry about. They had to become more knowledgeable. They had to instill confidence in their clients. And they had to protect their territory, uh, not only from outside architects, but also uh, from <coughs> engineers who were practicing architecture and people who were drafting uh, and practicing architecture. So this is an early photograph of the Newfoundland Association of Architects, uh, one of their meetings. Uh, and uh, you can't 
see if it does this come off, but uh, one of the architects I write about is Colburn, who is here. And uh, this is Angus uh, Campbell's uh, partner, George Cummings, over here, known as the polka dot socks. Uh, these are our dots, which you don't see architects wearing these things anymore. <laughs> so here, they've appeared. So this is Angus Campbell when he was younger, and this is uh, Frederick Colburn. This is Ernie Steinman. This is Bill Ryan. Who else has been here? The uh, man who hired me when I first came to Newfoundland called Forward. So during my work with, with Forward being Cullum, and it's actually Charles Cullum who hired me. Uh, this is the invoice for uh, the year 1950 for the association. They were big spenders, as you can see. Boston's restaurant, $52.50, uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, this is the original uh, registration of the Architects Act. And so for anyone who doesn't know who this is, <laughs> so, uh, so anyone who doesn't know who this is, this is the famous architect of Cuckoo DA. So again, I'm sorry it's cut off here, but uh, they are similarly attired and uh, the same glasses, the same swept back haircuts, the same bow ties. And uh, they both made big plans. Uh, Corbusier at one time wanted to tear down most of Paris and build towers in the park. And of course, Smallwood was interested in resettlement, so they thought boldly. And perhaps this is something about the modern era that uh, we can recall. Elizabeth Towers uh, is one of the uh, buildings that's associated with T. Porteous Bolton who was Joey Smallwood's uh, protege. Uh, this is an architect that he brought over from England, and uh, Bolton was working in the planning department of the provincial government. And uh, he became vice president of the, actually he became a member of the Newfoundland Association of Architects in, in the mid-60s, but not without a lot of uh, disputes. Uh, the architects wanted to scrutinize his credentials and uh, Bolton was resistant, he didn't want to be examined or uh, anything. And uh, Smallwood, of course, uh, was uh, outraged that uh, the architects were not admitting him. So uh, he threatened to revoke the Architects Act if this architect was not admitted. So they, they capitulated, they admitted him. He became vice president of the Association of Architects, Newfoundland Association of Architects in uh, 68 or 69. And then something very strange happened. He became a person of interest to the RCMP. And he uh, was rushed to the airport, hi hiding in the trunk of his car, uh, and driven by one of his employees, and made a big getaway. Now, I heard the story from many people, so I guess there's uh, some truth in it, but it was his sudden disappearance was the talk of the town at, at, in that era. Uh, that was one instance of uh, uh, Finger Smallwood, perhaps, uh, interfering with the association. The other instance was in the early 1950s, he had the brilliant idea that uh, when he was traveling in Germany that he could import top-notch German architects and establish a uh, department, an in-house department, uh, staffed by these architects who would, from that time on, design all the public buildings in the province. And he'd be able to do this on a, on, you know, with a kind of fixed cost. So. Uh, Fortunately, that didn't happen, but it was on his agenda at one time. So one of the chapters in the book is called uh, Modern Architecture in Canada's Happy Province, and uh, it's really uh, stolen from this little book that was produced for the 1966 Come Home Year. Uh, it looks almost the size of a telephone book, and it's a remarkable uh, piece of propaganda for the government, written, uh, Edward Roberts told me that it was written mostly uh, by Smallwood, or likely written mostly by Smallwood, but, uh, it was also the first book on modern architecture in the province, even though that was not its purpose. Because it has uh, photographs of many of the buildings that I'm presenting to you today. Uh, unfortunately, not high quality photographs, but um, still, they, uh, they really show what things were like in 1966 and what some of the priorities were. So um, I arranged uh, some of this material thematically, uh, almost in line with the, arra the arrangement for, uh, for this little book. Uh, Newfoundland, Canada's Happy Province. So some of you may know this little building. 
Um, this was a furniture store in recent years, but um, it looks rather forlorn now, and uh, um, it used to be uh, rather an elegant structure, uh, which was just one story, and it was hickory motors. Uh, so if you can imagine in the late 1940s, <coughs> Uh, coming out of the train station and seeing the future of transportation right there across the street. That's where it was. And this building is all painted white and it has curved glass, which is another miracle, you know, getting that glass here because it wasn't made locally, I can tell you that. And uh, having, you know, the, the cars and uh, the surroundings uh, pretty well, you know, kind of gray and, and smoky. Uh, and then there were uh, even influences in, uh, in upward architecture, this building, which I'm sure most of you know. Uh, the O'Brien store down in Cape Boyle, which has a kind of streamlined modern design, but done with shingles on the corners because you can't bend clapboards or mount corners. And the little building of Hickman Motors always reminded me of uh, Hopper's Nighthawks, that uh, same kind of curved glass and, uh, and maybe even some of the emptiness of Hopper is captured in this uh, wonderful photograph by Ruggles, who was a photographer uh, in, at this time, did wonderful black and white photography. Uh, I believe there's a Ruggles collection in the archives. Oh, okay. Definitely. So these are more of Ruggles photographs. Uh, here you can see the old streetcar tracks still going on on uh, Water Street. And uh, this gentleman buying carts, uh, it almost looked like Frank Sinatra, <laughs> you know, you know, the cut of the clothing and the little hat. Uh, and the raincoat is not very long, which is good too. Stylistically, it's, it's good. Here you can see the, how this must have appeared as an apparition, this Hickman Motors building, because everything else is sort of covered with coal smoke and soot and, you know, and old buildings around here. Uh, but that's the train station and that's Hickman Motors. And up here, you can, oh, if you look closely, you'll see two horses pulling a cart up uh, the street here. This is the interior. Uh, and it may be a disorienting photograph, but you're looking from up high down to the floor, and this had one of the first radiant in-floor heating systems in the province, so it didn't work, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was there. So thought that counts. We are this try to do this. <laughs> so, other precedents for automobiles, uh, one of my favorites. You'd be amazed at the number of architects elsewhere in Canada who know about this building. Uh, for Brian McKay Lyons, uh, who uh, is a well-known architect practicing in Nova Scotia, when he came here, he said, oh, that's one of my favorites. You know, it's like a little wind-up toy that you get at Christmas if you're a boy, and the car goes up into the garage, and it has a little ramp that comes down, so. Uh, and built right there on the waterfront. With uh, some precedence, this is a building by Victor Gruen, uh, a shopping mall in California where you could drive up onto the roof, so perhaps the architects, uh, Cummings and Campbell, knew about that building. And you had to be pretty brave to drive up here because if you remember the cars were long and low. And this ramp is incredibly steep. It would not make the coach. It would be great for skateboarding. But uh, the, I'm told that it was very hard to navigate around the corners here and that you would scrape off. So I never tried it. I was never brave enough to go up. Uh, but almost a sense of vertigo or seasickness when you get up there uh, that has something to do with the boats and the harbor. And there were some precedents even in vernacular architecture of this kind of streamlined design. You can see this rather brave curve and section for the old St. John's automobile garage. And other little buildings. This one you probably know is now Mumu's ice cream on King's Road. And then strange little uh, almost vernacular structures started to pop up all around town, these little shed roof garages. There were a number of them uh, in my neighborhood in Georgetown. And uh, I was quite fond of these of the ways of sheltering the automobile. It's almost like, you know, you've heard of animal husbandry. This is almost like automobile husbandry, <laughs> of trying to figure out a way of taking your care of your car. Uh, this one, I really like. This almost looks like it comes out of the original Shel uh, Shepherd painting. This is a garage outside at Rigas. Uh, this used to be at Adelaide Motors, and then it was a living toy later on. Again, the current streamlined design. So healthcare facilities, the, there were architects from the mainland who did a lot of these, they were the main consultants, and, uh, but there were local architects involved as, as well. George Cummins, who did a lot of work for the South Asian Army, was heavily involved with the race over the years, and uh, so this, this is some of his early work. Uh, there's the race before it was demolished, uh, and uh, this was a really remarkable uh, hospital because it anticipated what we're trying to do today in hospital design. Today, what we're trying to do is break down barriers between the institution of the hospital and the community, 
and some of the uh, most innovative hospitals are actually almost seamlessly integrated in the urban settings, uh, and they uh, are involved with continuing education and many other things. But in, in this neighborhood, uh, I heard many stories of uh, people going there on Sundays to eat dinner and, uh, and spending time in the hospital. Uh, my wife Heidi is here, uh, and she worked as an obstetrician in this hospital for many, many years, so I got to know many of the people here. But when our children were young, I would be here every weekend in the cafeteria with the children waiting for mommy to come downstairs uh, and uh, have a visit. Uh, so uh, it kind of took the life out of the neighborhood when this went. So there you can see the old one at the corner here. You can actually tell where the old and the new parts of the hospital were because the floor would change. You'd be walking on concrete, and then all of a sudden you could tell that you were walking on wood, uh, going from one side of the hospital to the other. So these are some of Ned Pratt's photographs. Uh, and uh, maybe a little bit of a precedent from Le Coupetier's Swiss dormitory with a curve at the base and then a podium type, or a rectangular podium up above. The old uh, nurse's residence, which is in heart shape and probably will be torn down because of mold, not because of structure. Uh, that's the real problem with this building now since it's been vacant for so long. But this had a swimming pool in it and uh, you know, quite an interesting place to live and also to study. And the very interesting corner detail here, which doesn't look very good with the, uh, you know, with all the screens that have been placed here, but this was a, a remarkable and thoughtful corner in its day. Christopher Pratt uh, very kindly permitted me to uh, use one of his um, a little excerpt from, a, from uh, his description of his painting, Institutions. So this is in the National Gallery of Canada. And uh, I thought it really captured uh, the atmosphere of the Grace Hospital. So I'm going to read a little excerpt for you uh, of his description of this painting. Pratt wrote about the inspiration for this painting. There's a painting that's actually here in the National Gallery called Institution. There were numerous studies for that painting, and I didn't really know what I was doing or where I was heading when I was doing those studies. When they finally got there, I realized after the fact that it was the view from the room, or rather it was based on the room, at the Grace Hospital in St. John's where I had my appendix out when I was 16, and not to be morbid or prophetic or anything about it, the same room where my father died 28 years later. Those things are not connected except by coincidence and the power of association. So you can see a similarity in the colors of the green and the gray and so on. And uh, in the book, you can't see it here on the screen, but uh, I was really uh, pleased with Glenn Galuska's uh, inclusion of Ned Pratt's photograph of the entrance to the Grace underneath the painting. So uh, father and son on the same page. So housing, uh, does anybody know where this is? This is probably the Pardon me? No? Corner book. Uh, this is on Marshall Avenue, a remarkable duplex that uh, really must have been uh, a strange sight. Built in the early 1950s by George Smith, who was an inventor and technician for the paper company. He, he designed and built these, and uh, he uh, had a good friend whose uh, family lived next door, so they, they lived in this duplex. And uh, I thought that I knew everything about the house, but then uh, the, I guess uh, one of the advantages of giving these talks is that somebody will come up to you and tell you something that you didn't know. And uh, Christina Smith, uh, who's a uh, well-known uh, violinist and teacher here in uh, St. John, told me that this was uh, her grandfather who built the house, uh, George Smith and that she used to go to the house all the time. So a few weeks ago, I actually uh, uh, got a chance to talk to her father and learn more about the house. Uh, but really remarkable with the, the concrete block, the glass block, and the flat roofs. And it almost reminds me of Le Corbusier's Villa Schwab, uh, which if you look at casually, you can't really tell how big it is, but it's not that large a building. You can see here from the door, but uh, some of the detailing is quite similar. So those little buildings are still standing. On Marcel Avenue, if you get a chance to go there, it's right behind the Glen Mill Inn. 
you probably remember uh, the London, New York, and Paris, uh, owned uh, and operated by Joe Goldstone. And he commissioned Paul Machino to design his house on Lost Elm Street, right next to the rapids of uh, Rennes River. Uh, so this house was completed in 1953, and it's truly one of the uh, most uh, original and uh, intact houses from this period anywhere in Canada. Uh, we're really lucky to have it, and it's been lovingly restored by Derek and Linda Rowe. It was the first time that a South Dakota award was given to a, the restoration of a modern uh, building. So uh, Machino couldn't keep his practice going here. After working on Churchill Park, unfortunately, uh, he left uh, to work in Toronto, and uh, he became uh, a very well-known architect there and did many, many projects, uh, both in Canada and the U.S. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Joe Scheuer and uh, Chris Sharp brought him uh, back maybe about 10 years ago, and we had a chance to actually visit this house with him. Uh, there's his plans. I'll just show you uh, Machino himself. There he is on the left. And it was the first time he came back to the house, and he really enjoyed seeing it. I think he, you know, he started to, he really realized that, it's, that it, the building had stood this test of, of time. So uh, some of his uh, working drawings here, you can see the elevations for the project. And if you've ever studied any of Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings, you can see that there's a lot of similarities to the Usonian houses of Frank Lloyd Wright of this period. And uh, Actually, the house was not constructed as designed. If you take a close look at these elevation drawings, you'll see that there's a tapering of the parapets around the roof. Uh, and that was probably too difficult to do. So it didn't get built that way. Uh, they're uh, plumbed to the ground. Uh, some of the precedents here you can see uh, Richard Neutra's uh, mosque house. Uh, this is cut off, unfortunately, the missing part of the image here. But um, there's a little column that's supporting this wide uh, portico here, uh, quite similar. Uh, to uh, Machino's design. And this is the way, no, you can't see it, we're cut off again, but that's the way the house appears in Canada's Newfoundland camp, uh, or Canada's second province. That's the front of it. And instead of the vents being on the sides of the windows, like in Churchill Park, you'll see that the vents are actually underneath the window here. These were pioneered by uh, several modern architects so that you would have security when your window is open and so that you wouldn't spoil the view with window hardware. And that's the interior of the living room, as it presently is. Another house that uh, is quite interesting is the um, Ewing residence on Circular Avenue West. And uh, Vicki O'Day told me a story about this, that uh, uh, Mrs. Ewing was enamored of the uh, Goldstone residence and wanted something similar, but not necessarily on the interior. So it actually has a more formal arrangement of rooms. Not quite the open time of the, uh, the Goldstein house. And it had concrete brick on the outside. Uh, another house that uh, uh, was actually uh, an import. This was the house of the year uh, in the mid 60s for Chatelaine Magazine, and it was built by Randall Pope in Grand Bank, and still looks like that today. And it looks like a house that belongs to California, but it held up pretty well in Grand Bank. Um, so go figure, right? And these little buildings here now. Buckmaster Circle, a miracle of modern housing design and community development, which had a rather bad reputation uh, because you couldn't police it and nobody took care of it. Uh, so I don't think it was uh, uh, entirely the fault of the architect, but um, they certainly didn't come back to do a post-occupancy evaluation. I had a lecture from the vice president of CMHC when I was a housing student at McGill University in the mid 80s, uh, who talked in glowing terms about the progressive aspects of this project, but he had never come back to see it or to learn about it after it was built. Another project that uh, not too many people remember, this is a design that Robert Forward did uh, not long after he graduated from Liverpool University School of Architecture, and these little buildings are right behind City Hall. Uh, by the time I did a renovation of these uh, conjunction with the Housing Corporation some years later, but uh, by the time I got to them, they were in this rather dilapidated condition. And the idea was that 
you could further punish people by taking off any handsome amenities on these houses, remove the porches, or remove the bay windows. So we actually tried to reinstate those features to make a kind of semi-private area between the street and the little building. Uh, another house that's very uh, interesting is the uh, uh, house that Nettie Spencer uh, had built along uh, Rennes River, uh, this on uh, Rennes Mill Road. And uh, Nettie Spencer was Smallwood's finance man uh, uh, in the late 1950s. And he commissioned Ernie Steinbrink, who was actually one of the German architects that Smallwood was successful in bringing over in the 1950s. So commissioned Steinbrink to design this house. And it has some very interesting features. These uh, little corner windows that are supported almost uh, magically by uh, chrome columns that you can see here, uh, making it you know, a kind of a mystery about how the roof is being held up. And this fluting with the lighting effects uh, and uh, different vent windows, similar to Machino's use of these, uh, but all different kinds of vent windows, this little um, lid that goes on top of the vent in the bay window, this one that folds back, and also some machines that will operate vents uh, in the walls. Um, some of them are no longer working. Special design for the garage door. And almost everything about it, uh, at least to me, it reminds me of a kind of Swiss chalet, right? A, a building that probably would be more at home in the mountains in Europe. Uh, but it was, was of course, uh, Steinbrink's design. But it's, it's always been a little bit of an anomaly in, in this neighborhood. That's the interior. Uh, another house, um, th this one designed by uh, William Brown, and uh, quite modern in its day. Uh, the interior uh, has a strange room with frosted glass right in the middle of the living room, actually. And that's the interior. It looks like this kind of a stage set for Mad Men. <laughs> All the furniture and everything is intact here. So does anybody know what this room is for? Why would it be a room like this in the middle of the house? Smoking room. It had its own vent, uh, an extraction fan in the ceiling, and uh, so you could be part of the panel, I suppose, and go and have a smoke um, right in the middle of the living room. Little hotels, uh, this one, Oh Happy Sight, I believe in Bonavista, with its curious little zigzag roof. Uh, these were very popular in diners in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, Kenmount Hotel, which was um, one of uh, Horwood's uh, designs, Horwood and Dean's uh, designs. Uh, again, with the vent windows, so the influence of one architect is pervasive. It's really carrying on year after year here. And of course, the innovative feature of this was that you could drive through it to a courtyard in the back. So a kind of port share for cars instead of for horses to go into the back. So the influence of the car. This one's, you can't see it, it's kind of cut off here, but this is the original design for the Battery Hotel. It looks like it was just published last week in the Canadian Architect. If you look at some of the new buildings in the magazines, uh, all the, the original details, we've, we've gone back to that kind of detailing again. Holiday Inn. And that's what it looks like today. Uh, so I don't think Small would, would be too pleased, actually. Uh, so, uh, this was intended to be right next to Confederation Building, within you know, part of the uh, government and university access that uh, was really designed to uh, impress visitors to the province. So uh, this is probably something that we don't want to do in that area. So educational facilities. Here you can see George Cummings uh, designed for Booth Memorial. I believe this is uh, this very interesting and sculptural entrance with a lot of Corbusier uh, type uh, details, very similar to his entrance for the Grace Hospital. That's the doctor's entrance to the Grace. Uh, John Hoskins design for uh, the um, Holy Heart of Mary. And I'm, I'm going to take one second here to try to adjust these for, uh, once again, because you're missing half the images here for some reason. But maybe Kevin can help me. A little bit better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. So uh, anyway, this is in my neighborhood, and I'm really fond of the school, and I hope it doesn't get torn down, and I don't care if there's no parking for the students, and I don't care if there's no football. <laughs> and uh, the 
an auditorium that's great, and there should be a high school where music is perhaps just as important as other things. So uh, take a look at uh, Mary Lewis's film on this topic, which I'm sure you've seen. Uh, another building that many of you may know, uh, Little Dale Complex, um, the uh, Catholic School for Women uh, in uh, Camp Bride, just off Waterford Ridge Road. And this photograph is taken, of course, before the highway was built in the hillside here. And probably the train is still going by in the valley. Uh, this building was a uh, collaboration of local uh, architects and architects from the mainland, but they created this remarkable cloister, a modernist cloister, probably influenced by Le Corbusier's design for La Tourette, which is also a concrete and brutalist uh, cloister. But uh, this has held up very well over the years, and fortunately, uh, Beaton Shepherd and Jim Case have just restored this uh, for an office uh, campus. So I think it's a very good adaptive reuse. Uh, not all the features could be retained. But uh, here you see the chapel and the interior of the chapel, the plank of the chapel, and the great elevation drawing down below, and some of my photographs before it was restored. Uh, beautiful terrazzo work on the stairs and so on. And from the air. Another similar uh, complex, this is the denominal, denominational complex of Queens College on the uh, Mount Campus, or just by the pond. And this was designed by Keith Graham, a well-known architect from Nova Scotia who was always involved with buildings for the Anglican Church, and in fact, at one time, was considering being a, an Anglican minister. Uh, so not all of this complex was built. Queens uh, College is really uh, it's, it's mostly this building here. There was a, another part to it with another courtyard. You can see here with a cross, but a lot of the dormitories were built. Uh, so these are the renderings for it from his office. And this is what it would have looked like uh, when it was branded. So uh, you can see the concrete uh, work with these ribs. Probably something you don't want to do in Newfoundland because they're very, very delicate and susceptible to frost. And a little bridge coming across here. And uh, this is what it looks like today. So this shows you what happens to buildings. We put in these wonderful things here. <laughs> and we put in these. And of course, concrete cracks and bits and pieces fall off uh, and so on. So not a very happy ending. But I hope that it can be restored. It has some great features. We used to rehearse here for the symphony orchestra. They have a nice hall. So you can see from the concrete is cracking a little bit. Uh, Bill Gaines, uh, designed for the chapel, I believe this is St. John's, mm -hmm. is that correct? Uh, next to, to this, anyway, that's the interior. And uh, that's his little drawing here with people in period costume. <laughs> the opening of Memorial University, uh, which is a great day with um, McPherson, the lieutenant governor, and uh, Shane told me, uh, this is Holly, uh, his wife, and uh, of course, Finger Smallwood, Eleanor Roosevelt, and John Diefenbaker, and probably as many of the cabinet ministers at the time in the background. And another great photograph showing how these little houses were just built here, but the four original buildings, the science building, the library, and the administration building, and uh, the gymnasium. Uh, no health sciences complex, no principal and drive, uh, and a little farm is still here in the back. Some of uh, Bill Ryan's early drawings for uh, Memorial University. He was commissioned to design the entire complex, but he lost the commission. Uh, I don't know if it was his fault, but I think that most likely Smallwood didn't like his design work. Uh, so perhaps he thought it was too traditional, and he did get into trouble a little bit with some of his design work, uh, because you can see his original design for the administration building was to have students enter in the groin and somehow exit through the head. I suppose when they're filled with knowledge. Uh, but the administration was to monitor their arrival here. So these offices were looking to see who was going to be late and so on. You know, a little bit oppressive. Uh, so uh, anyway, AJC Payne took over and then hired other architects to do each of building. Science building, probably the most progressive. Um, and the little courtyard, which probably seems the most university-like spot on the campus. The crest, designed by Robert Corwood, the architect that I told you about before, the rather unfortunate uh, traditional designs of uh, the uh, residences here. 
And this is an early plan showing what was on the go at the time. There's to be some kind of a tower here. Uh, here you can see Angus Campbell's uh, design, Campbellson uh, Cummings design for uh, the chemistry physics building and practical administration building here, or education building, sorry. And uh, then some of the dormitories here, no health sciences yet, uh, and so on. The marine lab in Logie Bay, which has not really had the new sympathetic additions uh, made to it. The, the new additions are kind of rectangular boxes, but the original was to be a sea urchin type of building, but you may not know it, but this is the original design for that building. Designed by uh, uh, Angus Campbell, and unfortunately they lost the commission to design this building. Uh, they thought they didn't have enough experience with laboratory work, uh, so it was given to a mainline firm of architects, but this was the original design for the building. And uh, this is very similar to uh, a building that was built just a couple of years before, which is uh, Bill Johnson's uh, design for the Annan Carter Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. So there you see the Annan Carter Museum. Same kind of detailing in the glass and so on. Uh, the plans for um, the marine lab, and uh, I won't go into those in any detail because I think I'm probably keeping you too long, but I'll just uh, try to go a bit faster on some of the slides. Smallwood, uh, very interested in uh, any kind of industrial development. Of course, you all know about his industrial his schemes of the 1950s. Uh, here he is in Cornerbrook working at a big model of the Fulton Paper Company, the superior uh, rubber company that produced leaky rubber boots and uh, also douche bags and a whole host of wonderful appliances. Uh, so, uh, but they just weren't very good quality. You wouldn't want to buy them, right? So, uh, rumor has it there were also all kinds of machines shipped over from Germany and uh, that they you know, did not know how to run them and so on. But the building still stands in Hollywood. There are some of the wonderful things that are made. That's the little model that I just showed you here. And then some background modernist building. So this is the old Bank of Montreal building, a kind of first curtain wall construction on Water Street, uh, and uh, replaced, of course, um, or renovated later on. But uh, we could contextually in its day. Um, I believe this is the Royal Bank, or Scotia Bank, I think, uh, on Water Street. That building is still there. But the interior is remarkably similar to what architects are doing today. That one mall. And that is not John Foster. <laughs> so somebody was asking. Okay. Here's the terrazzo on the floor. Cars for sale. They still do that. The cars are still in there. Uh, Tip Top Taylor's is there. And of course, Burks. Supermarkets. Uh, you know, why, why include these? Well, you just didn't have any self service supermarkets up until this era. You had to get everything. Uh, delivered to you if you went to a local store and have it wrapped in brown paper and, and string and so on. So on. It wasn't self-service. So this is a quite a, mo a modern way of operating at the time. Millbrook Mall, Corner Book, uh, a commercial building on uh, at least at that minute, the Imperial Oil Building, which was really something in its day. It may not look like very much today, but again, here's the vent windows. Uh, Bob Forward was involved with this project. And the Liquor Commission building on Camont Road. And different public works uh, of the time. The Sir Humphrey Gilbert building, which is one of the first uh, skyscrapers in the year uh, in this era. <coughs> the post office. And of course, Confederation building. Uh, so this is a great aerial photograph. Uh, this is actually uh, just a kind of coincidence that they cut a bit of Angus Campbell's house at the <coughs> bottom here. So that's Osborne Avenue. And uh, he had a swimming pool here, and uh, this is kind of the neighborhood recreation center because he really liked uh, all kinds of sports activities. So there were always uh, children coming and going in for that uh, on that property. The design is by AJC Payne, who also spent some time in Vancouver, and this is the Vancouver City Hall. So you may see somewhat of a similarity between these two. And uh, in my conversations with Edward Roberts, he said it was really a Stalinist design. I, I may <laughs> agree with him on that. It also looks a lot like the buildings of Edwin uh, Lepins in England, some of his buildings. Uh, this is the interior of the lantern. If you're standing up on the roof looking up at the little lantern, 
uh, which signifies that government never sleeps and is always watching out for you. Uh, so, uh, the interiors, where are the computers? You know, where are they? You know, how can you work without it? Everybody's doing things by hand. And formally attired. Uh, the lobby of Confederation Building uh, with um, a strange inclusion uh, that uh, Smallwood insisted that he be painted into this mural. Uh, and so here he is. And uh, he's, uh, you know, he's uh, welcoming uh, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, who is wearing nether stockings and Milan bonnet and has a little sword here. So he's welcoming, welcoming uh, Humphrey to the province. Uh, but Smallwood prefers more masculine attire. So you can see he's just been roughing it. He's been trekking through the wilderness. He's got these high boots and a sword and so on. But there's this awkward chief. He's supposed to be doing it first, by the way. Uh, but he's got this awkward chief with long hair uh, plastered on the back of his neck here. So, but if you go to Confederation Building, you'll see him there. And he's still there. Gander Airport, which is, according to uh, uh, Many one, uh, authorities, one of the uh, best modernist rooms in Canada. Uh, so it has been chopped up a bit because of security. There's a glass walkway that goes through it now, but it's remarkably intact. It has a lot of Ames furniture, and Gucci sculpture, uh, another mural. Uh, and uh, so most of it's intact, but there is this glass walkway through it now. But I do hope that this can be uh, protected a bit more. Now, many people know about this room. And Many people go to Gander just to see this room, believe it or not. So here you can see the original building from the outside and the interior again. There's a connection between the floor pattern and the furniture, which is very nice. Uh, Smallwood also uh, had the bright idea, and was probably a good idea, although a bit risky, to uh, see if he could scavenge some of the Expo 67 buildings and purchase them, dismantle them, and bring them to the mine. Because he really liked Expo. Uh, so this is the Yugoslavian uh, pavilion, and uh, it was re erected. Uh, it's now the museum in the Grand Bank. Uh, the difficulty was that uh, Charles Cullen worked on this project and was responsible for the re erection. Uh, once the building was purchased, many parts were lost. Uh, in shipment, and also the building's structure had been calculated in metric, and all of the work going on in the province at that time was in imperial, so the engineers had to recalculate everything. They couldn't figure out how it would work in metric. Uh, so it's still standing, and that's what it looks like on the bottom. And uh, you can see uh, what it looked like in some of the souvenirs. Uh, also the Czechoslovakian pavilion that ended up in Grand Falls. Uh, this is the model for the Czechoslovakian pavilion showing what it looked like. Uh, at, at Expo, and this is what it uh, looks like today in Grand Falls. There's Expo again. It's actually a larger complex, and this is the part that was re-erected down here. So I don't have time to go into the features of it, but uh, just want to let you know it's there. An early sketch for the Arts and Culture Center, uh, there on the left as well. That's what it's supposed to look like. Uh, a mural carved into the, uh, actually baked into the bricks by a Quebec artist, and uh, George Cummings, and uh, also a Joy Smallwood, and uh, Mary Lou Farrell, who was a well-known singer at that time. And uh, of course, the architect is in charge because he's holding the pencil. Uh, this is Angus Campbell. So uh, that model is still in the lobby of the Arts and Culture Center, if you want to see it, it's under glass. I always thought that the interior of this lobby was done very well because the lighting levels are just as dramatic as theater lighting. So you go to the opera, not just to see the opera, but also to be seen, right? Part of it is the theater of going out into the lobby and meeting your friends and you know, showing people how fabulous you look. So uh, this is actually one of those places where you feel that you're almost on stage for reception uh, or for the intermission. And of course, the wonderful detailing uh, of this auditorium uh, the concrete work was just exquisite. Every little form tie and every little board is placed just so. And how they did it in this era is, is uh, really spectacular. And of course, the, the wave lighting of the ceiling, of all these little lights that hides the mechanical equipment. So recreation, the original stadium from Memorial Stadium, which never got built, uh, designed by Forbid and Rennie, 
in the <coughs> probably in the late 40s, early 50s. And the image that's on the cover of my book, uh, another design by Howard and Renning, you can see it's another cylindrical type structure. There's a solarium on signal field as a kind of protected lookout so that you wouldn't have to uh, worry about the, the weather. That never got built. Uh, the cost was about, the little inscription here, cost was to be about $8,000. Uh, but just a beautiful drawing the way this was done in a quick sketch with watercolor. And the uh, visitor center on Signal Hill, which is almost like a parking lot uh, type uh, building, sitting on, on the on Acropolis with its tapered walls. Uh, these are early designs by uh, Bill McCallum for the uh, visitor center uh, that you just saw uh, when he was working with the NGM. So these did not get built, but uh, remarkable series of drawings that he did. The boathouse, the way it used to look on the Bleedy Kitty Bay Lake. Uh, some of you may remember this, uh, the pool complex in Victoria Park, which had a very interesting uh, semicircular plan. And a project that not too many people know about today, Plan for a Park. Uh, this was by uh, a little a, a project that the city of St. John's um, started with the uh, Quebec architects of uh, Van Ginkel Associates, Sandy Van Ginkel and Blanche Lemko Van Ginkel. Uh, the Van Ginkels were later involved with Expo and they were also uh, probably uh, uh, responsible for a lot of the, the conservation of old Montreal. Uh, but they were brought in uh, to work on this project in 1959 for extending Bowling Park and produced a little book which is in the Canadian Center for Architecture uh, with these little drawings showing a couple of bridges that would go over the railway. These little bridges are still here. And also different pavilions and different gardens for the park that never got built. Uh, so their expansion plan was never realized. Uh, this is for a little boathouse area. But something that has survived that many people have forgotten about is the pedestrian bridge in Valley Park. And uh, there is uh, a very famous engineer who was involved with uh, this structure, the engineer Oak Arup, uh, when he was still alive. Uh, if you're an architect working internationally today, if you want to have some uh, innovative engineering done and to make sure that things get built right, you hire the firm of Oak Arup. And so the firm is still going strong in London. But uh, when Arup was still alive and working, this was one of his projects. He was awarded the uh, gold medal of the RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects, in, uh, I think, 1966. Um, and he was asked at his acceptance speech which were his two favorite projects. And the first was the Sydney Opera House, and the second was this pedestrian bridge. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a little gem there. Of course, the train doesn't run underneath it. This was for safety to get people over the, the train. Uh, that's one of the original sketches of the architect. And if you can imagine, perhaps, an elephant sitting on the ground with its legs perched there and then the long trunk reaching over. That was the analogy that I heard from Bill McCallum, who once had Sandy Van Ginkel as his tutor at Technical University of Nova Scotia School of Architecture. So uh, that was the analogy with the elephant and the trunk. Uh, and it's a pivot. So really all of the weight is here. And uh, the heavy steps here hold it down. And it just barely touches down at the top. So it's quite a, quite a feat to, you know, to calculate all this without a computer. So perhaps that's why Eric really uh, was proud of this design. And some of the details, uh, the road bridge they also designed, uh, even the formwork you can see here, the, as we call it, the false work, uh, and so on. Salvation Army Citadel in St. John's by George Cummings. Um, and the uh, St. James United by Bob Forward, again with the zigzag little roofs. And this one, uh, designed by Eric Jarrett in Grand Bank. Another zigzag. Bill Brown's design for St. Augustus. Uh, and this is the uh, Church of the Holy Redeemer, I believe, from Cornerbrook, uh, probably inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, built uh, by, actually designed by a Boston firm of architects. And this is probably one of the best ones, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Marin County uh, Civic Center with this tower-like feature. And, uh, and so on. So a little glass block on the side here. That building is still standing. Uh, Ernie Steinbrink's design for the Lutheran Church. Uh, there was a uh, little uh, 
were many people from Latvia and other uh, countries where there were a lot of Lutherans who came here to work on some of the industrial projects in the uh, 50s. Uh, and so they needed a place to go to church. And uh, that was really the, where this, how this congregation got started. Uh, it's now an office building. Another one of Keith Graham's projects, uh, St. Mary the Virgin. Uh, that's the model. And this is actually Keith Graham. And uh, uh, he's uh, still practicing architecture and he's in his mid-90s. So still in Nova Scotia. Uh, this is a photograph that I took one afternoon when I just made a kind of uh, uh, cold call to see if I could take a photograph of the church. There was no one there and I banged on the door. And fortunately the janitor was in there sweeping away and he heard me and he let me in. And I said, can I take a photo? And he said, yes. So uh, he's sitting here in the front and his vacuum cleaner is here. <laughs> and the altar uh, uh, cloth is actually Fold it over the top, so it's you know you should prepare for your photographs. But uh, when Keith saw this, uh, Keith Graham saw this photograph, he thought it was one of the best that had been taken of the building. It, it, there's a kind of delirious aspect to this. It's almost like a kaleidoscope that you would look into, and you would see the shifting colors, and uh, quite a remarkable sense of scale with the side aisle and these boomerang trusses. Uh, so uh, perfectly intact and a real gem. It looks good close up, and it looks good from the distance. You can see it from different areas in the larger building. <coughs> And of course, there were ch modern churches uh, all around the province that got started in this, in this era. Uh, this is a little church in Tilting. Uh, nobody's pleased with it because they really miss the old church, but uh, the priest was in charge in the late 60s and said they had to come down they needed a modern church. But uh, anyway, this, is ha this was happening all across the land. So uh, Frederick Colburn, this is a self-portrait of Frederick. Maybe he did himself, so uh, some of his etchings. Ink drawings, I'm not sure which they are. Probably ink drawings, actually. Remarkable uh, series of oil paintings uh, that the family still has. It has to be Wedgerton, I'm not sure. And some of uh, Frank Notes of Louis Bittes' uh, work when he was working with Frederick Colburn. Uh, and this is one of my favorites in my neighborhood, Holland Hall. It was vacant for a few years. Uh, but it's now once again used as a school. And I really like this because it's background modernism. It completes the courtyard. It acts as a bit of a lantern at night with the light coming out of the glass block. And it has this remarkable corner which uh, is obsessed with the idea of turning the corner somehow sculpturally, which is something that architects are often preoccupied by. And he did a number of schools. Uh, Colburn's office did a number of schools. This one's Bishop's, I believe, uh, with all the glass block. And it's picking up on the latest in school design really the latest of trying to figure out ways of enhancing the educational experience, ventilation, life, and so on uh, for students in this era. Different houses that he designed. Uh, this one, the Clifton residence at the corner of Ross Dillon and Elizabeth Avenue, still standing with uh, beautiful detail. And that's the interior. A little bit of a curved planter that you can see coming in here. And there were many skylights in this house as well. I think they've been removed. Um, a little house that uh, Colburn did for the, uh, actually it's for the Kinsmen uh, in the mid-1950s. And it's almost like a uh, representation of the Goldstone House with a horizontal element and a vertical element. Um, this was auctioned for charity in uh, about 1954 or so. And that's the winning ticket. So if you ever go past Churchill Square, you'll still see that that house is there. It's uh, uh, well taken care of by the Knoxville family, and uh, they love their house. Uh, everyone tells them, put a pretty much roof on it, you know? But I get rid of those modern features. I mean, if, you have this, if you have this ripped glass on the inside, you know, why do you have that glass? Get rid of it, you know? Uh, but they, uh, I think they value it, and uh, it has some great features. So anyway, first prize was the house. Uh, it was won by a woman uh, from Logie Day who was farming, but she didn't want the house, so it was actually sold. And the second price uh, was a new Ford, uh, and it had the deluxe feature of having uh, a heater. So, <laughs> you know, before that, probably didn't need it. <coughs> so that's the interior. Uh, beautiful detail for the shelving, very much like Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, with Roman brick quite a long brick above the fireplace with the shelves carefully uh, interspersed between the courses of brick. And of course the glass screen 
Uh, in the sunset, this is very, really beautiful with the light coming in through the back of the building. Another one that's uh, one of my favorites, uh, a house that's uh, presently owned by Scott Jameson and Angelo on uh, Forest Avenue. Uh, so this was a house actually for the McDonald family. Uh, and uh, uh, McDonald, as some of you may know, was a pharmacist. I think he had his uh, uh, pharmacy in the old Newfoundland Hotel. Uh, but a lot of these details are still there. There he is in front of his house. Uh, these photographs, courtesy of his son, uh, uh, courtesy of his son Ron McDonald. Uh, the back of the house, when the McDonalds were still living there, you can see by the furniture what year that it was. And the interior, again, uh, as soon as I entered this room, I knew that it had to be a colder design because there's the similarity of the bookshelves intersecting the wall above the fireplace. And some of the built-in furniture, this is before, uh, when uh, Scott and Anne were just starting to work on the property, so it doesn't look very good, but uh, Colburn was one of those architects who was really interested in doing something between furniture and architecture. In other words, things that would be built in and custom-made for the family. So this was for the son's room. You could sit here and you could work here and so on, keep your clothes and have a little place to sleep and so on. And even in the cabinetry, this must have seemed really high-tech at the time. This is in the main bedroom, so you see a wall with a mirror but then as you get closer to you, you see that the, it actually opens up and it actually turns around. So, uh, you know, it's kind of presto. You know, imagine how proud you would feel to demonstrate this to your visitors. Uh, ultra high tech. But you don't need an electric motor. It'll work even if there's a power failure. Uh, another house that uh, I really like is, uh, some of you may have seen this on Ross Dillon, the Silver Residence. And uh, this is another one of uh, Colburn and Notes, where these projects were made were in fact together. And uh, this house had a bomb shelter in the basement, or a fallout shelter, as did many of the houses that I've shown you today. Um, and uh, just shows that people were really concerned with uh, the Cold War. Now, I'd like to just quickly read to you the architect's specification for the fallout shelter and what should be included. So this is actually in the package of drawings uh, that the contractor had to provide these things. The list of equipment that accompanied the drawing for the fallout shelter included beds, cooking vessels, disposable cups and plates, knives, forks and spoons, can openers, paper towels, a kerosene cooker and kerosene lamp, an electric lamp with batteries and spare bulbs, a flashlight, 10 gallons of kerosene, two in the shelter and the rest in the basement, matches, a garbage can, two if no wastewater runoff was possible, garbage bags, a toilet with two weeks supply of polyethylene bags, a shovel, crowbar, axe, pocket knife, whistle, pliers, fire extinguisher, battery radio, and spare batteries, clock, and basin, and spring. I don't know why you have to need the spring, but I guess you do. So, uh, part of the era, uh, the shelter was really not, I don't think it was ever built the way it was specified, and it was turned into a Turkish bath. So. <laughs> Brookfield ice cream, I guess one of the hazards of uh, writing a book is that you think you got it right, but then people tell you, no, you got it wrong. So I was told by um, uh, one of uh, Frederick Colbert's daughters that uh, my uh, statement that the architect was unknown is incorrect, and it was actually her father who uh, designed this. And she used to get free ice cream whenever they would go there. So, uh, you know, really an exuberant modern uh, piece, uh, which doesn't have its original detail anymore, but had uh, vitrolite, which was a kind of Pittsburgh plate glass uh, cladding on the outside. Uh, so quite modern and uh, clean for a dairy. One of uh, Colburn's projects, uh, his, his church projects, which I think is, uh, is really outstanding from this era, is St. Michael and Mount Angels. And here you can see, uh, taking a little bit of a break after uh, with the old cars here. And uh, you know, really a, a remarkable little building that fortunately has been saved on the outside. The interior is no longer intact, but it's now a recreation center. So at least the outside is still there. Uh, that's a view probably from uh, St. Clair's Hospital next door, looking down on it, people coming out. And some of the structures that um, you would read about in occupied St. John's in the background of uh, all these, uh, these military buildings in the background. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Uh, these are probably some of the precedents, Dudox Town Hall and Hilversum, uh, but there were many projects like this, rather modernist town centers. 
one of the Ned Pratt's beautiful photographs with a little bit of snow on the top of this brilliant tower. Imagine describing this to a contractor in this era, trying to figure out how to get, to get it built. They have to make a little cardboard model or something to show exactly how it went together. Uh, in quite interesting detailing on the edges of this building uh, to uh, bend the light around the corners, uh, reminiscent of uh, the modernist uh, Car Carlo Scarpa, who did work in Italy, which most architects revere and know about. Uh, but here's Colburn anticipating uh, something that was happening 20 years later. And the interior when it was still intact. Uh, moving on to Angus Campbell. Um, this is a collage of drawings from um, the advertisement, one of the advertisements that his firm placed in Newfoundland, Cap Canada's Happy Province. A kind of collage of all of these different buildings. So if you study this for a long time, you'd probably see uh, Carnell's uh, funeral home here and uh, some of the memorial buildings and uh, Bethel and so on. This was a drawing of Nev, Nev Mills, uh, who was uh, uh, still a practicing illustrator and has done work for many architects in Newfoundland over the years. A really talented uh, architectural illustrator. So um, Angus Campbell, who I got to know only a year or two before he passed away. Uh, but he was really helpful to me and explained a lot of the background of practice at this time. And you could say that he had one root in tradition, another one in uh, uh, modernity. This is a drawing by Roy Pirouet, uh, who was working for him, uh, and uh, one of the people doing drafting. And it's the um, uh, tower for the Anglican Cathedral project to uh, actually build the tower. So, remarkable drawings. Angus was an athlete, uh, and uh, here he and his uh, teammate, Jeff Sterling, have just won a track meet against the Americans who were stationed in Argentia, and this is the American Rear, Rear Admiral Rose awarding the trophy. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, one of uh, Angus's uh, paintings, both Campbell and Colburn were what I would call painterly architects. They were drawing all the time, and uh, taking photographs uh, all the time. So it really informed their work in architecture. Um, this is the office uh, of uh, Cummings and Campbell. You can see a little alcove with Angus Campbell working in the corner, and everybody's wearing white shirts, and again, working without computers, uh, doing drawings. Uh, that's the little office building on Argyle Street that's still there. And kind of an early curtain wall, uh, possibly locally made. He designed a few little office buildings uh, uh, in this era. This one, the medical complex on the list of Avenue. Merit Insurance, which is now Cardiology Associates, I believe. It's been renovated. That's what it looks like today. Uh, Chimo Building. Uh, Crosby Building, which uh, has these machipulations on the top as if somebody was going to attack the building and then you could, you could pour boiling oil on them or something. <laughs> uh, it's kind of out of character for Campbell. But, uh, Fortress-like structure. Parnell's, which is very similar to uh, Taliesin West of Frank Lloyd Wright. You can see the drafting room at Taliesin West in Scottsdale, Arizona, with its sloped roof and uh, kind of uh, you know return wall perpendicular to the roof. Um, and of course, uh, different stores around town. Giant Mart with the same little piles that you would see on the Empire Avenue Medical Clinic. And in his last years, he actually became a mentor uh, to uh, some architects and uh, was writing, he wrote an article in the Referee Journal on Canadian uh, hospital design and showed some of the innovative features for the Carbonier Hospital, which you see here. Uh, by this time, he was associated, he had already associated with uh, Horvath and Gian, so it was Campbell, uh, it was uh, Horvath Campbell Gian, and then uh, that practice dissolved and uh, Angus Campbell went his own way. Uh, when this building was being built. So there's the model. And that's the floor plan. The idea was, I don't have time to go into it, but the idea was that we would have this kind of hexagonal floor plan with a room that was a bit of a triangle and you could divide it into two, but that every bed would have a, a view through the window. So they actually built a mock-up of this, a full-scale mock-up of these rooms uh, in the uh, garage that was behind uh, the old family court building on uh, Kingsbridge Road because uh, Howard, uh, Campbell and Gian had their office in that building before it became a family court and then burned down later on, as you probably know. 
but they built this, these full-scale mock-ups in that little building uh, behind uh, uh, the house and uh, got people to dress up as patients and nurses and try out the furniture and the lighting and everything, which is what we do today. We do a hospital uh, as architect, we, and we're going to spend millions or billions on a hospital. We always do a full-size mock-up. So this was, I think this was progressive as well to try this. So here you see them all dressed up. I don't know what the disease was so back then. <laughs> and the rendering uh, for this. Uh, a training college for the Salvation Army, again with Campbell's angular designs, which responded to the speed of the car. But if you see a building at an angle, then you probably have a better chance of, of seeing it. Uh, so many of his designs were angular. Uh, and also the uh, uh, buildings done for the trade schools. Um, and a number of them in Conception Bay that Cummings and Campbell worked on, uh, seal cove, uh, carbonier, urine, and so on. And here in Buren, they've made a courtyard, because, probably because of the wind protection, even with glazing that extends up above the roof for further wind protection, and the designs for uh, Memorial University. Uh, some of you may, may remember the breezeway that went underneath these buildings that connected with the cafe and the courtyard and a little reflecting pool. And the College of Trades and Technology. So, uh, one of the churches that uh, Angus Campbell designed uh, that never got built uh, for Grand Falls, but very similar to uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Unitarian Meeting House in Madison, Wisconsin. But what I find interesting about this rendering is that he's accepting the indigenous flora. He's not changing and putting in grass or something. He's just leaving uh, some of the rocks and the, uh, and the existing shrubbery. And of course, Bethel, Bethel synagogue. Uh, photographs taken by Max Fleet. This is when that was built in the late 1950s. Some of the renderings. Uh, that's a photograph by Ned Pratt. Uh, a real essay on, on almost all the ingredients that Frank Lloyd Wright used, of compression and decompression that you move through it, uh, uh, of a uh, uh, sense of reverence in the, in the chapel that you don't see out, but you have a uh, remarkable light within, uh, the idea of making a courtyard with a tree growing up through it, uh, and so on. Lots of uh, very interesting things in the floor plan, um, and, but not without its problems. It leaked, and it was hard to heat, uh, so uh, I fully acknowledge that uh, there were significant problems with the building, but uh, perhaps it could have been saved. And uh, more of Ned's photographs. This is a really nice one too because you can see how it relates to the scale of the houses on Elizabeth Avenue. Some of the drawings. And that's what it looked like today. Uh, house for uh, the Hickman family, and uh, another house that I told you about before, you saw in the earlier photograph, the house for uh, uh, Campbell's partner, George Cummings, which uh, recently uh, belonged to Joyce McCain, and we were going to restore it, but unfortunately she got ill, and uh, she recently passed away, so, uh, but she let me take all kinds of photographs of this. This one also had a bomb shelter under the garage, so there's a large piece of concrete under the garage for the bomb shelter. And that's what it looked like uh, when Joyce had the house. Again, the vent window, uh, if you see here on the side, that idea is, is even persistent here. And this house, some of you may remember, this is a painting by uh, Reginald Shepherd of, uh, uh, of Newfoundland House, uh, Premier Smallwood's residence in, uh, on the farm in Roach's Line. And uh, the premier was so happy with uh, Campbell's work on this that he wrote an inscription in the book that he gave to uh, Campbell. And he said to Angus John Campbell, the most original and innovative architect that we have produced since I was born, and that was in 1900. <laughs> <laughs> so the house, uh, from some great photographs that are in the archives. I wish I could have kept all these for the book, but I think I had 600 illustrations. They wanted 240, so uh, I did the best I could. But uh, some of the family photographs are just great, you know, showing the house in this period in its original condition. Uh, the side plant of the house looks like an arrowhead, um, and uh, there you can see the interior. Well, probably influenced by two unbuilt houses designed by Frank Wright uh, in 
Montreal. Uh, so um, I got the plans from the CTA, and you can see a remarkable similarity in the layouts and the obsession with the geometry. A couple of the uh, carpenters, this is uh, Howard Roberts, uh, the carpenter for the house. And I just want to read you one little story of how Howard Roberts came to be commissioned for this. So Howard is, was originally from Brigus, and he was uh, asked by the premier to uh, stop by one afternoon. Knowing the premier, you had to be on time. So I drove in Roach's line, and it was about quarter to three when I got to the house, and I stopped. I said, I'm not going in at quarter to three. I waited until I just got to the door at three o'clock. I had to tell you that because that's what I really did. And I comes in, and he unrolls the plans. He always called me Mr. Roberts, never Howard. And anyway, he said, I'd like for you to build my house. I want you to build it, and I want you to finish it. And I said, Mr. Premier, I'll build your home. Whatever men you like, he said. When can you start it? As soon as I get the bulldozer equipment to dig out, I'll give you a call, he said. You'll be on the payroll. Whatever you need, you'll get. The job is yours. He was excellent. He couldn't be better. He'd keep in touch when he was traveling. So uh, this team of carpenters did some remarkable things. They built the house probably in record time. They didn't have a lot of heavy equipment. They had to mix the concrete themselves on site. They worked through the winter. They would use water levels to arrange the foundation instead of transits and so on. Uh, but I got a chance to meet Howard uh, at his home in Mount Pearl a couple of years ago, and he had great photographs uh, of uh, the crew and of the house and so on. So that's the story of, of that house and how it got to be built. The interior has a tile pattern above the fireplace that's almost like the stars at night. And uh, that's the area that goes down to smallest library in the basement. Beautiful mahogany inlaid floors. Uh, some of the details in the house, a lot of uh, 50s era tile um, and built-in lighting valences. Windows that didn't have corner mullions, very much like the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, mahogany paneling that was quite difficult to do it without frames, so you notice that the doors have no frames. Uh, it's almost identical to the detailing of Steinbrink in the Spencer residence of, of many of those rooms, of trying to remove frames and do things with invisible detailing. Some of the equipment in the house, exterior detail. The interior, uh, it's, uh, it's almost like a folded paper airplane. You can imagine the impression this must have made on visitors as you round the fireplace and you come into this triangular room that has this incredible vista out to the pond and the hills and uh, this folded plate of, of a roof. The fireplace here on the left, but never got used by the Smallwoods, but was used by the carpenters to make tea during construction. Uh, so they were really afraid of fire, and as you probably know, Smallwood had lots of books. So another view when the Smallwoods were living there. And the latest and greatest, you know, Smallwood was interested in everything that was progressive and new and uh, the most modern. So these are cabinets that were designed by the uh, Mullins Manufacturing Company in Youngstown, Ohio. It was called the Youngstown Kitchen, the streamlined modern cabinet. And uh, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to play a little movie for you, uh, which is uh, an advertisement for these cabinets and a chorus of kitchen cabinet salesmen who work for the Mullins company. <laughs> Now we're going to sing a song dedicated to Youngstown Kitchen, which is the theme of this whole program. <laughs> Young 
speak for everyone when I uh, say that you've opened our eyes to the many wonderful structures around St. John's and indeed around the province. Uh, my wife and I happen to be very close friends to the uh, Colburn family and I, uh, they're very deeply appreciative, I, I think you already know, of the tribute you've uh, provided to their father, Frederick, in your book. And, uh, you know, it certainly opened my eyes to his artistry and to the artistry of his contemporaries. And uh, for that, we're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we have time for a few questions or comments. If anyone cares to make them. Yes, in the back. Um, what uh, happened to the... Uh, the uh, not the corner winners, the... Uh, the slash window, bent windows. The little back windows. Where did they go? I, I've never seen a bent window. Churchill Park. <laughs> uh, the ones on the on No, but do they machine. build them anymore? Do you get no. them now? Oh, what Why? happened to them? Yeah. Um, some architects still do include them. Uh, there were architects by the name of Keck and Keck who were working in the 50s and 60s especially and on the mainland and actually in the U.S. who included these in almost every design. Uh, Richard Neutra used to include them in his designs in the 30s and 40s, uh, but some architects still use them, uh, but you may not notice them. They're not so visible. Uh, but they were, a, they were a neat idea. I think in Churchill Park what happened is that most people didn't like that they were drafty. There was really no, not very much insulation in those houses, so a lot of them were removed. And, or what would happen is that people, if they did decide to keep them, they would um, put a uh, a fiberglass bat behind the interior shutter for the winter use, and then take the take it out. Uh, the only problem with those windows for use on the second floor of a house is that you wouldn't be able to get out if there was a fire. Oh. So uh, for egress, you need to have a window that can open. So uh, that certainly would meet the code. But for the main view windows, I think it was a nice idea. Really interesting to me to see the number. I haven't actually shown you all the buildings that have these bent windows, but really interesting to me to see the, the path of this idea over time of how many other architects picked up on it locally and, uh, and tried to incorporate this. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Robert, I, I have a, a few points. Um, I think that um, uh, St. Bride is, is um, a cert derivative. St. John Dewey cert. You know, like his museum. Um, also, the Scotia, the building that you showed that had the modernist, that was originally uh, a Victorian building that was chopped down. Was it renovated? Yeah. I see. I saw the original drawings of it. And I was surprised. I, I never saw that. I also think that that when you go back to the derivative of um, of the um, uh, the 
Lincoln Building to Vancouver. I think you might even go back from Vancouver to Los Angeles. By the way, uh, this is Bill McCown, who is a distinguished architect here, in case any of you, any of you uh, uh, don't know, but you probably know. And Bill helped, Bill helped me enormously in my research. So uh, he has a remarkable memory of uh, the architects from this era. Um, just a couple of other things. Um, I wanted to say that, and I did send you a comment written, that the interior of St. Mary's is, has been repainted, yeah? and that was the repainting scheme as laid up by Ned Mill, yeah? because it has the warmer colors. The original colors were um, grays and um, blues, you know, cool, because that was the, the color of the time. I'd also like to say that I, I worked with all the Arabs people in 1969 in London um, on a dining hall for the University of Tripoli. And that summer, midway through, there was a revolution by Gaddafi. <laughs> so all things go around. <laughs> and just to, to, to to liven it up a little bit. Some of the guys in the back room were doing a mosque. And, and we said, you know, this was, seemed strange. I mean, you know, for modern architects to do a mosque. You know, and we sort of looked very circumspect about it. But they, to do the dome, they literally had to bring a string out, you know, into the other room to strike the um, curve, but you know, it was one of those things that you remember. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's. Um, go ahead. Thanks very much, Bill, and thanks for your help uh, on uh, all of the fine points. Uh, one of the things that uh, I learned after writing this book is that you could probably never finish a project like this, and I've had so many emails from. Uh, uh, people who remembered certain buildings, uh, for example, uh, I mentioned that I now know who designed the Brookfield ice cream, many other uh, uh, instances of, uh, of more stories about buildings and uh, little anecdotes and details or even things about authorship. So maybe if it ever gets uh, reprinted in paperback, uh, some of these things can be uh, augmented or, or corrected but it's almost like there's no end to a project like this. I hope that I can somehow uh, put a web page in place that others could perhaps contribute some of their stories to this, because there are many buildings that I never even talk about here, and many of those will disappear. So if we had some kind of an archive that we could contribute to, I think it would really help. You had a question? Yes, actually I have two. Uh, the first is, why did We don't know who the architect was for the rubber factory, but uh, I haven't been able to find out. Uh, but there was a thesis student at Dalhousie who uh, did this about two or three years ago for his thesis, and uh, I don't believe that he knew, but uh, it was quite an interesting design with the sawtooth skylights, and there's been a lot of discussion over the years of somehow adaptively reusing that building for something because the concrete's in pretty good shape. The windows are all out of it now. But for the brick at Memorial University, this is always a bit of a mystery to me why there was a buff-colored brick there in the first place. Because the four original buildings had kind of a beige or a buff-colored brick. And that was something that was very hard to make locally. There was a company called Pelly Brick that made kind of uh, you know, a, uh, a dark brown or reddish, almost like this, uh, brick. Uh, and uh, Pelly was one of um, Smallwood's uh, political uh, sponsors. And Smallwood was always looking out for Pelly, trying to keep him in business. The problem with that brick was that it, locally, they didn't have that technology for uh, heating the brick to the point where it would really be 
vitrified and would withstand the climate here. It was more of a soft brick. It was burnt on, you know, on the surface. It was okay, but when it was used, for example, for the uh, nurses' residents, uh, the general hospital down by uh, uh, Lake, uh, the brick failed to absorb moisture, and they had to paint it. So you see a banded painting scheme on it. Uh, but why that dark, you know, why the dark brown brick, the local brick, wasn't used, I'm really not sure. And also for Confederation, it's more of a buff colored brick. And then for many years, there was a kind of um, rule at the university that if you did a building, it had to be brick. Uh, so that's what we were told when we were working on, working on some of the buildings. And preferably more of a dark brown brick, uh, more like the Arts and Fights and Culture, Culture Center. But by that time, the Nova Scotia firm of Shaw had joined forces with Pelly locally to make Pelly Shaw brick. And they were doing different colors. But the, the buff color came from a clay from the mainland and was brought here. So at least a lot of this is what Bill McCallum has told me. So uh, that's how I got the money. So Bill, we don't work on these. Can I respond to that? Sure. First of all, I think that rubber plant is a German design. You know, it looks to me like it, it has that uh, northern you know, derivative. And I'd say that's where that came from. Um, now, the, the brown brick, the first time I saw it, you know, as against the the buff red was in the um, uh, the college uh, trade college you know it was then you know it's Kona now covered over but they had a lot of brown bread and that was probably sixty two you know, that I saw that so I think that was the introduction of the, of the dark red. and you're right about the Pelly it just didn't collapse they didn't collapse it so that it was um, <laughs> there was one other thing um, I wanted to uh, mention, and um, um, that is someone up there said about the saving of these buildings, you know, and I think, you know, that's another story, but if we have a heritage list, you know, I guess that was formulated in 74 by Shane and Day. Looking back at my archival things, I don't know the exact date, let's say 200 buildings, you know, we've got to get a modern list, you know, because, you know, going back to writing the are happening and they're going to happen faster and there's going to be a new municipal plan. And, yeah. Great. Yes. Somebody told me about an interesting house there, but they thought that perhaps it was no longer in its original form. It was form. destroyed in the, uh, in the 90s. Yeah, I heard something about that. And that was almost the country at one time. Uh, it was so. very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Was it? Do you have a photograph? I know, but I could probably find one. I'd love to see one. Okay, there's a question in the back there. I think we'll have uh, maybe a couple more questions. So there. Okay, Robert, one last question here. And, uh, in, the, in the 50s, uh, there were a whole bunch of 
bunch of phone architects here yeah. that came with small Wilson Industries. Yes. With those people, and they uh, designed a number of those uh, industrial buildings, uh, the modules, the uh, what was the octagon plant? Yes. For example, uh, and one of the uh, architects was a guy by the name of William Jenny. Have you ever heard of him? Yes. I have you worked with Ryan? Yes. I interviewed yes. Ryan and he told me he was partly responsible for making the first design for, for the university, the present campus, uh, which he said was not accepted fully. Yes. But it, uh, most of the basic design is still the same. Yes, it, it is. Only a minor modification. They did make some modifications, yeah. but the spirit was <coughs> the yeah. uh, Steinberg was also one of, uh, one of this group. But I'm just wondering, uh, what kind of an impact those, those architects had, if any at all? Mm. I suspect they were just too modern uh, for the local scene and yes. for, for the local colleagues uh, to be accepted. Uh, That's right. But there were quite a few of them here, and uh, it has always uh, yes. sort of uh, struck me yes. uh, that they didn't leave more traces behind. But uh, you, I, you showed the Steinberg Towers, uh, but uh, uh, some of those factories would be interesting examples, for example. Yes. Uh, the only work plant was probably designed by Ryan, uh, not by Ryan, I mean by, by Jenny, I'm not sure. You know, mm. this, I was wondering if you knew uh, more details about that. I wish I had more information on it, um, but uh, I only heard a little bit about this, exactly what you're saying, from Angus Campbell, because he, of course, was working with Ryan at that time. And he said that there were quite a number of architects from elsewhere working in that office. Uh, and a lot of them had uh, great building experience. So there was the, I think there was the understanding that um, uh, they had access to uh, certain types of construction technology that were perhaps not yet uh, uh, available in Newfoundland or even in Canada. Uh, so uh, there was this thought that we need to, to modernize and get the latest information. And, uh, it's surprising really how much Smallwood knew about these things because he was making trips to Germany and he was trying to bring equipment over and, and, and so on. He thought it was a great opportunity after the war. But I think the, the example that I uh, was using of uh, Steinbrink, uh, you can see even in his dress and his attire that you know he's wearing uh, more or less a, uh, uh, a bold fashion here and he, you know, he's, uh, he almost exudes the, the impression of, of a Bauhaus architect. And then he designs uh, a house for Nettie Spencer a couple of years before Smallwood gets his house designed by Angus Campbell. And of course, in the Spencer house, which I'm sure Smallwood would have visited, uh, he's, uh, Smallwood sees this incredible detailing. Like I showed the mahogany panels in Smallwood's house, well, the, uh, the Spencer residence was, has rooms, uh, room after room, of these mahogany panels with the doors that are almost invisibly sliding without frames into the wall. And of course, the high-tech gadgetry of three different types of vent windows, and miraculously holding up the corner with a prone column, uh, and you know, lots of real, lots of innovations, plus rather a modernist and spare detailing to it. So, uh, I think uh, you know that's that's probably a good example. I think Steinbrink uh, uh, was quite active over the years in the Association of Architects as well, and he was always known as Dr. Steinbrink. Uh, so that's what I always heard. So uh, he was uh, revered, and uh, he was thought to be a mentor, uh, somebody who was a great resource for uh, government to perhaps review the work of architects and advise uh, on design issues and many other things. So there is a legacy of this, and I hope that I can find some more information. But thank you very much for your question. Okay, uh, I've got the final word. Uh, Robert, there was one major mistake made in your presentation tonight, and I hesitate to point it out, but when you, uh, when you were talking about the marine lab in Longy Bay, you mentioned that the plumber was uh, modeled after a sea urchin. Uh, you're talking to a marine biologist here, obviously. It was actually modeled after a sea anemone. Sorry. <laughs> that, that's the danger of having a biologist on the history society. I think I got it right in the book, but I was too scared to pronounce it in the book. No, don't. <laughs> I'm sure everyone would like to know that. Anyway, a couple of things. Robert mentioned that he has a dozen or so copies of his book for sale in the lobby outside, so there's a good chance to get a signed copy. 
And let me say too, it's a good chance to get it at a discounted price. He's providing it tonight at, uh, at cost. So it's a good opportunity if you want to grab a copy. Uh, one last thing, our lecture, uh, our Gilbert Higgins lecture will take place now in February, uh, next month's speaker. And the lecture will be Dr. Fiona Pollack uh, with the English Department at Memorial University. And her talk is titled Mirror Islands, the Colonial Histories of Tasmania and Newfoundland. Uh, I happened to attend one of her presentations recently at Memorial, Memorial uh, on the colonial treatment of Aboriginal groups, uh, Viathics here and Aborigines in, in Tasmania. And uh, it's just amazing the, the striking similarities in the way the colonial uh, governments dealt with Aboriginal groups.